And today's message is the opportunity of a lifetime. Um, I decided to, to name it something that you all have probably all heard before, and you're probably going to roll your eyes, but ain't nobody got time for that. As if there's anybody on this planet that has never seen that video, today is your day, okay? Because you're about to see Sweet Brown, amen, talk about ain't nobody got time for that, so we all go ahead and shoot that video. One resident describes her horrifying experience when she first realized the complex was on fire. Well, I woke up to go get me a cold pop, and then I thought somebody was barbecuing. I said, oh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. <laughs> then I ran out. I didn't grab no shoes or nothing, Jesus. I ran for my life, and then the smoke got me. I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> I like how she had her inner Elder Robinson in there. I didn't grab my shoes and nothing, Jesus. And I agree, nobody has time for bronchitis, but I'm going to also tell you some things that ain't nobody got time for. But first, I want to set up my text as my favorite thing to do. Um, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Now, David had recently become king, but God had promised Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. <laughs> That's been a hot topic lately, hasn't it? And I actually agree with the Bible. Amen? Amen. Whether or not I agree politically with everything our president does, I agree with that decision, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And I thank God that America was the first nation to stand up and recognize that. Okay, so anyhow, Jerusalem was not yet the capital of Israel. It was occupied by these guys called the Jebusites. Okay, now the Jebusites were some bad dudes, but David had God on his side. And David had taken out the, the, the Goliath and previously had taken out the bear and uh, some animals and different things, that tried to, the lion that tried to take out his sheep. So David knew that God was on his side. So he goes and he takes Israel. And when he takes Israel, he begins to build his army. And these armies, they have some units of 200, some units of 500, some units of 1,000 in different sizes. And each unit had this gift or this uh, strength that they brought to their particular unit. Um, some of them were good with weapons. Some of them were good with, uh, with other areas. But then we get to the, to the tribe of Ishkar. And they are my favorite. This is from the tribe of Ishkar. There were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. And listen to what their strength was. All these men understood the signs of the times and they knew the best course for Israel to take. See, the tribe of Ishakar recognized when there was an opportunity of a lifetime. They recognized when it was time to see something. Their gift was they were able to see exactly what to do in whatever given moment they were in. And I believe that God has given us that same ability. Jesus said, in the end times, he said, you'll see the signs right? Jesus gave us the ability to have insight on when to strike and when to do things and when to pause and when to proceed. And the tribe of Ishakar had that same gift. They knew exactly what to do and when to do it. They knew exactly how to use their time. Now let me explain to you the title here. The phrase, the opportunity of a lifetime, has two very important words in it. One of them is opportunity. The other is lifetime. See, the word opportunity means something, but we're going to get to that in a minute. But the word lifetime indicates there's a timetable on that opportunity. And in context here, it means something even more significant. The word opportunity means that the right set of circumstances are in place to make something possible. That is the exact definition of opportunity. The, everything is in place to make this moment possible, and now is the time to strike. Now I have the opportunity. Why do many teams lose sporting games? Because they don't seize opportunities, right? As a Louisville fan, I know all too well about not seizing opportunities. And they seize the wrong opportunities, which we won't even get into. And I figured John would chuckle with that. But opportunity means everything is in place. All the wheels are in motion. Everything is, and if you don't see that moment, if you're not paying attention to that moment, it's going to pass you by. Amen. Now the word lifetime. You've heard the term once in a lifetime, right? 
Well, this is very similar because the word lifetime simply means everything has a shelf life. Everything has this timeline that it functions within that once that timeline is gone, then whatever that thing was supposed to do is over. It either did what it was supposed to do or it didn't, but the time is over. Now, the opportunity of a lifetime indicates this is not something that comes around very often. you got to be paying attention in order to be able to seize this. In the tribe of Ishakar, that was their gift. They were able to just see things and know, right, can you imagine having something like that in your army? That was their gift. They knew right when to strike. They knew right when to retreat. They knew right when to sleep and right when to get up and right when to eat. They just knew these things. They had a gift inside of them, and God has given us the Holy Spirit. See, the Old Testament saints, they didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, but we do. So just like the tribe of Ishakar, we can see the right set of circumstances. We have discernment. We have the gifts of the Spirit working in us, and we can see when the time is ripe. But see, here's what we do sometimes. We don't function in that gift. What we do is we make resolutions and we set goals and and we have all these things. And then what happens? January 1st comes along and we're all at the gym, right? On a treadmill. And if the treadmill gets a little ahead of you, grab them bars. Right? Hey, I ain't trying to lie, man. Sometimes that thing gets ahead of me. I'm, I'm hugging on them bars. And then what happens? Over time, what happens? Opportunity passes by. We lose focus. We get back into that rut. And by the way, the only difference between a rut and a grave is a couple of feet. Hmm. Better get out of that rut. You might be digging your grave. But we let the opportunity pass us by. And folks, I'm not telling you it's wrong to set goals. I think we should. But more than anything, I think we need to pay attention. We need to look at the season of life that we're in. And we need to be like the tribe of Ishakar, Know the times and know what to do. And I'm here to tell you, there is something about this year. There is something about this year that I feel something in my spirit. That if the church misses this opportunity, we're going to be in trouble. But I'm paying attention. And I hope you are too. Because... I don't know how likely it is to pass by again. I say all this because Lakeside sits on the opportunity of a lifetime. The people that God has aligned in this church, the leadership that God has aligned in this church, I don't know how long it's all going to be intact because God moves people sometimes. And that throws me off. I hate it when people move. Because I get a plan and then they move. We had a pastor to move to Alabama right in the middle of my plan. We still haven't recovered from that. But I believe this is the year we will. Because I believe God has put people in place. And I'm ready to seize this opportunity. Folks, ain't nobody got time to waste. It's time for us to do what God has called us to do. As a church, we have been focusing on revival in 2017. I talked last week about several revival-oriented events Um, We had impending revival, if you remember that. We have had several conferences. We have another one coming up next month, February 16th and 17th, I think it is. And it's the Power Conference. (laughs) I am excited about this conference. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday conference. It's going to be incredible. We've got several great speakers lined up. Um, Some of them, one of them you will hear for the very first time, Brother Sidney Hunt. Um, Pastor Boswick is going to be preaching. Dr. Norm is going to be preaching. It's going to be super exciting. And we are going to be talking about the power that belongs to the church. Folks, it's a power we need to seize now. It's a power we need to seize now. There are opportunities in place that the church is missing because we don't walk in the power. But the power is available. As I said earlier, Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. We come to church and what do we expect? Let's be honest, what do we expect? (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) What do we expect? We expect a church in at noon, or I'm going to get hungry, right? We expect uh, the worship team to behave, right? We expect the cheering to be quiet. Do we expect God to move? 
Do we expect God to heal? Do we expect to walk in and see cancers fall out of people's bodies and dry up and die? Amen? Do we expect to see people who are sick, who are broken, who are beaten down, who are addicted be set free? Because I do. But we all need to be in unity on this thing. In Acts chapter 2, it says they were all together in one accord. They were not in a car, folks. Okay, that means they were all together on the same page, unified, thinking the same thoughts. We can't even think the same thoughts sometimes in our own household. Scattered about all directions. And folks, it is time. We have an opportunity. And I believe it's time to seize it. Now, what's it going to take to seize this opportunity? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because I studied all week on the answer. I believe we have the right set of circumstances in place for revival to burst forth at Lakeside and to see a move of God that we haven't seen in years, and I believe this is the year. However, what we call revival, the apostles called Christianity. It was a normal expectation. When that man was sitting outside by the gate begging of those who entered in and Peter and John, they came upon him and the lame man expected of them and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such have I give unto thee. Then in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Thomas Aquinas was once told by a bishop, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. And he said, yes, and they also can't say to the lame man, rise up and walk. See, I think churches lose their focus and put them on buildings and programs, and they don't remember that our mission is not to build buildings and have programs, although sometimes those buildings and programs serve the mission. Our mission is to see the lame walk, to see the sick healed, to see the broken delivered, to see the lost saved, and we need to get back and focus on that. Amen? It's time for the church to recognize who we are, and raise our level of expectation when we come together. If I can just get to the parking lot. See, I'm not saying God can't bless you while you're by yourself. God blesses me real good when I'm by myself. But there is something about the corporate atmosphere. When it is ripe, when it is ready, and when everybody's walking in a spirit of expectancy, there is an explosion that happens in the spirit realm that cannot be reproduced on my own. And I am expecting to see that every time we gather. And it is time for all of us. There are a lot of churches in our community and across this country that do not expect God to move. In fact, they get upset if he tries. Don't mess with my one-hour program. I'm not knocking churches that have one-hour programs. But folks, if God comes up in the middle of your, we had a 45-minute Easter service, or I'm sorry, a Christmas service. But if God would have showed up, I'd been like, look, y'all can go when y'all want to. Amen. But I'm staying here until he does something. Amen. Amen. And I'm not saying God isn't here. Don't get me wrong. But I am talking about a supernatural work that was normal in the early church. What would we do today if somebody couldn't walk was sitting out in front of our church? You need some food from our food bank? We might pray for them, give them a few dollars, but when any of us say in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And then will we have the faith to pull it off? Because I love what the next text says, and I think differently than a lot of people, but it says this man got up walking and leaping and praising God. And everybody looked and took note that it was the same dude that was just sitting outside that couldn't walk. And I don't imagine this normal-looking man. This is a man that hadn't walked in a while. He probably had scrawny little old legs, probably the funniest-looking thing you'd ever seen in your life because he hadn't used his legs, running around, dancing around, you know, weak little legs. And I don't know if God filled them with muscle instantly. I just like to believe that he had those little scrawny, sickly legs that he had to build his strength back up as he learned to walk again. It was obviously a miracle. And I believe miracles can return to the church. I believe the church in America has been a mere shell of the New Testament church, and it's time for that to change. We can be great. Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Do we grasp that? See, Elder Robinson, you know what I think the problem with the American church is? We don't believe the word. Because if we believe the word then there would be none of this mess going on. 
people wouldn't be running off on their spouses. Amen? There wouldn't be no two-timing, three-timing, four-timing. There wouldn't be children bored in the presence of God. Amen? Because it would be so exciting. It would be so electric. No matter what age you are, you couldn't wait to get to the house of God because you're going to see some crazy things happen. And that was normal. You started Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost fell, and normal changed. See, normal was old stodgy religious people walking around saying, you can't do that. Your tassels need to be a little closer to the ground. You hear me? And we're to a point to where the church doesn't look all too different. But it's changing. It's changing. You've heard that song, the atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. And we were on a mission in 2017 to make it very plain that God, you are welcome in this place. We started a prayer initiative like we've never seen before to say, God, you are welcome in this place. We even let it spill into the main sanctuary. We let tongues happen. We let whatever happens during these prayer times because we believe we want the power of God in this place. And the only way to do it the Bible says to stir up the gift that is within you. It's like stirring that pot and saying, God, I'm believing you. How many of y'all remember those old-timey pumps? We're at the well. Amen. And what would happen if you didn't pump that thing for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks? Oh, you had some work cut out for you, didn't you? But if you primed that pump every single day, and you got that water stirring every single day, every morning you get out there, you hit that pump, and you got a supply of water. And I believe that's what we did in 2017 is we were just hitting that pump. And it's like, this thing looks dry. This thing looks dry. I don't know what's going on. But then every now and then, a little water would spurt out. And we'd get all excited, and then we'd quit. Woo, woo, did you see that with water? Woo, right? No, you got to keep going. So I'm challenging you this year is we've got to push that handle all the time. Make sure that water is consistently flowing, that it never dries up, because we have a well that's filled with water that will never run dry. Jesus promised the woman at the well, if you drink this water, you will never be thirsty again. And I'm here to tell you that I believe 2018 is the year that the water is going to start flowing because the people are ready. So, I said all that to say this. If we want to seize this opportunity of a lifetime, it's going to take a new level of corporate prayer than we've ever done before. A new level of corporate prayer than we've ever done before. And I want to illustrate this. This is a text I used throughout the entire series of impending revival, but it is 2 Chronicles 7, 14 through 16. And this is an Old Testament prophet speaking. He said, Then if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal or I will restore their land. Now listen to this. I didn't read this part. I want you all to hear this. It says, My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made. But then there's three words that follow that are important. In this place. See, these folks gathered together in a place to pray. They say, I don't need to pray corporately. I pray every day at home. God bless you. Thank you. But there's nothing like the corporate anointing. And folks, we have got to understand. This text was written in a time of national crisis. I think we're there. Amen? I think we're there. But listen, he says, For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever, and I will watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. Now look, I'm not trying to say the church takes the place of the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But what I'm saying is there's something about people that gather. Now, God made some promises there, and I pointed this out before when I preached this text. He said, if you'll do some things, then I'll do some things. Number one, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. Now, many believe that, that uh, the, there's many texts in the Old Testament that refer to humility and humbling yourself to fasting. I do believe that fasting is a good practice for God's people. Amen? The second thing is humble themselves and pray. Right? So we need to pray. And then it says, and seek my face. You notice he turned it, he, he separated those two, because a lot of times we equate prayer with seeking his face. He didn't say, seek my hand, seek my blessings, seek my face. Want my presence, desire my presence. So don't just humble yourself. Don't just pray, but seek his face. 
want to be with him. And then it says, and turn from their wicked ways. Folks, there's sin that is in the house that's got to go. Last week it was mentioned that we believe that God can, or God can take us to a place to where we can be free from the power of sin. Amen? I believe it. Now listen to what it says he promises that he'll do. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. Do we want to see revival? Then we have got to pray. Seek God's face, humble ourselves, and turn from evil ways. Then we have a certain promise. He'll hear from heaven. God wants to hear us. Do y'all realize that? God doesn't get annoyed with the same songs over and over like we do. Amen? God doesn't get annoyed with us like we do with our kids sometimes. I'm just being real. Amen? We don't get on God's nerves. The moment he created us, he delighted over us. Matter of fact, the Bible says even before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and called you to be a prophet to the nation. God put a call on your life before you were ever born. He is madly in love with you. And he wants to see you fulfill your purpose in him. So God's not trying to play tricksy with us. He actually wants to bless us. But he can't bless us if we're arrogant, prayerless, don't want his presence, and wicked. Are you hearing me? It's time for us to turn away from those things. And then he says, my eyes will be open and ears attend. How many of y'all want God's eyes and ears on you? That's the way to do it. To every prayer made in this place. And I believe those words are prophesying over this church. To every prayer made in this place will produce a harvest. But folks, the prayer team can no longer be us four and no more. It is time for us to outgrow that prayer. I remember we were getting close to that point of outgrowing the prayer room, and then we kind of relaxed. So this is a message of encouragement, and at the same time, it's a message of challenge. One of the things that I used to say is, if you come to Lakeside, you'll either be motivated or offended. Your choice. But we're not going to let you sit on the seat and just coast. Folks, it is time for you to engage your purpose and do what God's called you to do. And part of your purpose is to prayer not only privately but corporately with the body God has called you to. And folks, just a few people can't pull a big ship. And this is a big ship we're trying to pull. There's a whole world out there that doesn't know Jesus. There's a whole community surrounding us right now that don't know Jesus. There are people that come to our church and stand in the food bank line that don't know Jesus. And they are dependent on the corporate prayer of this church. Why did the early church call Christianity what we call revival? It's because they were people that believed in corporate prayer. There were people that came together in times of crisis. There were people that prayed and sought God together. And folks, it is time for our church to seize this opportunity. A church without corporate prayer, ain't nobody got time for that. We make it as simple as possible. We meet on 930 on Sunday. We meet at 6 o'clock on Wednesday in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening on Wednesday. We keep this, the church open the entire time for 12 hours for you to come in and pray, even if it's just by yourself when there's no one in here. But folks, if we don't grasp this, I don't know that this church can seize this opportunity. Now, I know that's heavy, but the thing is, I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't believe you want it. Are you hearing me? I believe you want it, and it's time for us to start to come together in mass, not just a few of us in mass. I look for the day when Dr. Norm comes in my office and says, Pastor, they're spilling out into the foyer. we got to do something. And I just say, just let them spill. Spill over in the sanctuary. Spill everywhere you got to spill. Walk on the campus. Do whatever you got to do. Let them loose. Because we ain't going to get a thousand strong we got seven people praying. Are you hearing me? Folks, it is time for us to seize this opportunity. Are you ready? Are you ready to have the level of expect- expectation and excitement that the early church had? Then we got to pay an early church price. I believe the church lost its focus on prayer hundreds of years ago. And now there are voices crying out in the wilderness and prophets that are proclaiming we need to bring prayer back into the house of the Lord. 
You look at the book of Esther. You look at the book of Joel. You look at the, many of the prophets. Every time there was a national crisis, they went back to corporate prayer. What if they had never left corporate prayer? What if the church stayed in a constant state of corporate prayer? What could we avoid? I'm telling you one thing we couldn't avoid, and that's revival. Amen? I cannot wait till the day that we call revival regular old Christianity. Healings happening every time we come together. Drug addicts being set free every time we come together. Crutches laying across the front. Wheelchairs being wheeled in with people walking behind them that used to be in them. Blind eyes open. John Helton. I still believe and know that one day you're going to drive to church and tear everybody up. Everybody's going to be like, oh Lord, what's going on? Many of you that have been dealing with various illnesses and, and, and problems, you're going to be healed. But let's start at the beginning and let's pray together again. Amen? Very simple. <laughs> Show up an hour early before either service and you got it covered. Come in a few minutes before work on a Wednesday morning and you got it covered. Come in lunch hour on Wednesday anytime throughout the day and we got you covered. But it's time for us to come together corporately. Amen? Second thing. If we want to seize this opportunity of a lifetime, it's going to take a new de level of dedication to the things of God. Folks, the willy-nilly American Christian commitment is not going to work anymore. Amen? When I feel like it, when I want to, when, when the kids ain't got this, and when this ain't going on, and when everything's all lined up, then I might just be able to be faithful to something other than Sunday morning. Because, you know, most everybody comes Sunday morning because, I mean, it's Sunday morning, right? I, if, if I burn that excuse up, then I, I might not even be saved anymore. Joking. Maybe. But, folks, if you don't want to celebrate and fellowship with God's people in God's presence, I do have some questions for you. Amen? So if we want to seize this opportunity of a lifetime, it's going to take a new level of dedication to things of God. Turn with me to Haggai, chapter 1. I love that dude's name. Hey, guy. If I'm saying it wrong, don't tell me. Hey, guy, chapter 1, starting with verse 2. Listen to what this says. It says, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. The people are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, to give you a little context of this, the house of the Lord had been sitting in ruins. The temple had been sitting in ruins for some time. Um, they were in captivity, and uh, some people were wanting to rebuild the temple, and... There were some people that were saying, oh, you know, oh, I'm ready for all that. Yeah, I think I'm good with, you know, I got me a nice house. I got me a nice life. And man, if we stir up this stuff, we might stir up some trouble. So I'm just going to leave this alone. And they're saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. But listen to what the Lord says. Then the Lord sent his message to the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Now listen to this. Look at what is happening to you. You planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but can't keep warm. Your wages disappear. You're putting them in pockets with, filled with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what is happening to you. Now go up to the hills and bring down timber and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. When you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while you were all busy building your own fine houses. Now, we obviously aren't talking about building an actual temple here, but remember, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what God is saying is saying, you're putting your own stuff before mine. And there's a really peculiar text in here that you don't hear a lot of people preach because we know God is good, but it says, I want you to, 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 to pay attention here on who did what, because I think that's important. It says, when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins. See, we have this image of God that he never does anything to punish or to correct his children. Can I tell you, sometimes your harvest is getting blown away by God because you're not following his plan. And folks, it is time for us to put God's things before our own. Crickets. Are you hearing me? We have had it our way for too long. Did we lie? As Brother Mike said, 
when we sing, you can have it all, Lord, every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. See, we like giving God our junk. Lord, take my sin, take my mess. I'm so sorry. But then when it comes to your dreams, like, whoa, 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 what are you going to do with those? Whoa, wait, wait, whoa, whoa. I, I like that stuff. Don't, don't. But we don't realize. <laughs> Folks, we need nothing but revival. And if we're not in pursuit of God's presence and God to move and God to be real in our services, what in the heck? <laughs> Y'all thought I was going to say it. Are we here? Why are we here? If we don't expect God to show up and do things that we can't do, I can do that by myself. Amen? But it is time for God's people to put his things first. Half inch of snow on the ground, God's people acting like there's two feet. Boy, they'd be plowing through that snow to get that paycheck, though. Hmm. I meddle every now and then, just in case y'all didn't notice. Look, I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm trying to position you to receive a miracle. Are you hearing me? They said, the time hasn't come yet. Well, what is that? That sounds like an excuse. Doesn't it? That sounds like an excuse. Well, I got these other things to do. You know what Jesus said about people that made excuses when they were invited to the wedding banquet? He put them out. He said, go out in highways and hedges and find some folks that will work. Don't make excuses. The time for excuses is over. Come expecting. Everything we do as a leadership soul is, is, is for one purpose. That's because we want to see God move. Why do we have a youth program? Because we want to see God move on a level that our youth can grasp. Why do we have a children's program? Because we want to, our, we want, look, we can't just keep the kids in here every week. They're going to be lost. We want to send them to a children's program to where they can re, uh, receive a message from the Lord in the way they understand. I love the Pastor Courtney calls the children's church upper room ministries because it's a reminder to these kids that we are Pentecostal. We expect God to move. We don't just come to fill an hour or two hours or however long it takes. We come expecting God to do something in our lives. We come expecting for an impact to be made. And folks, we are a Pentecostal church. I cannot grasp coming to a Pentecostal church without expectation. Everything we do is because we want God to revive our church and to revive our city. But if you're only dedicated when it's convenient, the opportunity is going to pass. Folks, being undedicated to the things of God, ain't nobody got time for that. I'm not saying you have to do everything, folks. Don't mis misunderstand. Nobody can do everything. But most of us can do more than we are. Most of us have another gear if we're willing to tap into it. And folks, that's what it's going to take to seize this opportunity that God has laid at our feet. Just look at the ministry team God has assembled in this church, and you tell me that God didn't position us for this moment. We are ripe. We are ready. But it's going to take a new level of prayer and dedication. Then the last thing. And whenever I say that, I see some people's hearts leaping. I know the last thing and in closing doesn't mean much, right? <laughs> I was waiting for that, John. If you want to seize this opportunity of a lifetime, you're going to have to let some traditions die. Luke chapter 9, verse 28 through 36. Now, some significant things had happened in Jesus' ministry, and about eight days after these things, Jesus took, starting verse 28, Peter, John, and James, those were the big three, right? The NBA teams have their big three. Well, disciples had their big three as well. And that was Peter, John, and James. And he was praying, and the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and were talking with Jesus. 
They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about the exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. <laughs> I don't feel so bad now when people fall asleep at church, you know. Peter and, I mean, this is going on, they fell asleep. They woke up, they saw Jesus' glory, and two men standing with him, Moses and Elijah, were starting to leave. Peter, not knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials. Let us establish a tradition based on this moment. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, the cloud overshadowed them. Terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice came from the cloud, said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice was finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anybody or anyone at that time what they had seen. You know how traditions are typically established? Because God does something significant. And we don't want that moment to pass. And see, this is where I think God's people really get hung up, and it's time for us to get unhung from that. We get hung up in a moment that God did something significant, but God doesn't want to take us from this thing and keep us there. God wants to take us from glory to glory, not tradition to tradition. Are you hearing me? God doesn't want us to establish traditions. He wants us to establish his glory on this planet. And sometimes that means traditions have to die. Folks, I love tradition. You ever seen Fiddle on the Roof Tradition? I love it. I love things that get established because things happen. But I don't want to get stuck there to where God, if you don't do it this way, then it's not of God. And some of y'all have heard that before, right? If you don't sing this type of song, it's not of God. You don't preach from the King James, and it's not of God. If you don't do this, and it's not of God. And if you don't have wooden altars, it's not of God. And if you don't have this color carpet, it's not of God. See, what did Jesus do when he came to this planet? He blew up some traditions. The Pharisees weren't. When God begins to move, religious people get upset. Because it messes with their established traditions. Just like Peter got up and said, let's build a memorial right here. Let's capture this movement of God and let's all stand up. And God's saying, no, there's ministry down at the bottom of the mountain that we need to get out and do. Because what happened after this moment? There was a man having an epileptic fit and Jesus healed him. The disciples couldn't do it. Why? Because they were too busy trying to build tradition instead of build his kingdom. Are you hearing? I sure hope so. But traditions form because God did something great, and those traditions are wonderful. You wouldn't believe how many times I've heard in my course of ministry, especially as a youth pastor, because as a youth pastor, you do risky things like bring pro wrestlers to your service and play weird music and, and bust up all kinds of traditions. You can't do that. Sister Ethel donated those. <laughs> yeah, but this space God gave us, we want to be able to use it for this, and and. I remember it was an ordeal to paint walls at one of the churches I was at. It was an ordeal to do anything at one of the churches I was at and, and to move anything, to touch anything. And it was just like, oh my gosh, it was like a noose around my neck. And I wanted to see God move, but I didn't want to create friction. And I feel like churches, they, they, something happens. And we honor that moment. And we appreciate that moment. But if we're stuck in that moment, God's doing a new thing over here, and we're over here worshiping this tradition, and we've lost sight of God. Are you hearing me? I'm not opposed to traditions. But I am opposed to traditions that serve a moment rather than serving Jesus. God wants to take us from glory to glory. Listen to this. Revival dies when God's people choose to preserve traditions rather than advance the kingdom. It is time for us to recognize if we want to see God move, we're probably going to get some of the things that we hold dear wrecked. And the question is, what fruit is it producing? Because I don't care what traditions we wreck if I'm seeing people healed. I don't care what traditions we wreck if I'm seeing people get saved weekly. The baptismal, can't, we, we, we can't even keep the water clean because people are getting baptized so fast. Healings, addictions, being set free. 
Folks, you can have any tradition I hold dear if you'll give me that. Take the seats out of this room, we'll sit on the floor, rip up the carpet, we'll sit on the concrete. I don't care. If people are getting saved, that's what I care about. Now, I'm speaking kind of facetiously in a way, but I'm here to tell you, we cling to things that happened years ago that aren't happening anymore. See, God says, I'm doing a new thing. Now, God doesn't change, but he's doing something new in us because we change. If God does the same thing in us every day, we're not going to grow. Are you hearing me? I want God to do something new, and sometimes it's going to wreck traditions and things that have been built on what we think is him. That blows me away that Peter, right there in the moment, said, let's build three shelters as memorials. What purpose is that going to serve? There are people down at the bottom of the mountain dying. Let's go down there and minister to them. I want to tell you something. We start seeing drug addicts get set free in mass. We start seeing sinners get saved in mass. We start seeing people get healed in mass. We're going to see some stuff we ain't used to. I mean, Jesus slapped mud on some dude's eyes. I think that probably broke a tradition. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. A church that doesn't pray corporately. Ain't nobody got time for that, folks. We've got to get serious about it. A church that isn't dedicated to the things of God and seeing revival. Ain't nobody got time for that. A church stuck in lifeless tradition. Ain't nobody got time for that. We sit at the opportunity of a lifetime. I cannot believe, I cannot believe the leadership team God has established in this church. A church our size, to have the quality of people we have in leadership is ridiculous. The people God has sent on this worship team, for a church our size to have a worship team like we have, considering the loss that we've taken in the last couple of years, you ain't going to tell me this stuff don't mean something. We sit on the opportunity of a lifetime. The question is, are we going to be like the people of Ishakar? Are we going to understand the times and know what to do? Because I'm here to tell you, folks, I know what to do. I know what to do. If we pray corporately, Amen? If we put God's things first and we hold lightly to traditions, I think we put God in a position where he has to fulfill his word. I'm going to ask you to stand. We can just get some music in any form, any fashion. It's real light, real easy. Altar time is very simple today. I'm going to ask us to do the three things I've just talked about. I'm going to ask us to come together as a church and pray corporately. Last week we celebrated and did all that stuff, but this year, or this new year, this is serious. I'm going to give us some time to seek God in this altar and pray corporately together. If you've got any prayer needs, if you need Jesus, if you need a financial breakthrough, if you need healing in your body, I'm going to ask the ministers to go ahead and come. If you need somebody to pray over you, then we got you covered. But nothing more than this. To say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to turn from my wicked ways. I'm going to put your things first. And Lord, I'm going to lay some traditions at your feet. Because I'm ready to see you move. I want you to come. Everybody. This isn't just a some people. This is a everybody. And again, if you want specific prayer, these fine folks have got you covered. If you want to find a place to pray right there at your seat, you can kneel at your seat, but let's pray together. And I'm going to ask you if you'll lead us like you do the prayer team during this time in altar. Jesus. And let's just Thank agree together. You. Thank you, Father. Let's open our mouths and begin to pray. I want to hear it. Just come out of your mouth. Let's begin to pray. Let's begin to surrender our hearts to the Lord this morning. Let's begin to open up our hearts to Him. Hallelujah. I want you to see yourself just standing before His mercy, standing before His grace. 
I want you to begin to pray and say, Lord, this is the area that I, I have need. This is the area that I need to be touched. This is the area I want to experience you. If you need somebody to agree with you, don't feel free. Just feel free. Come to one of the ministers. If you're struggling with an addiction or a habit that you want to come out of, the answer sometimes is to come and agree with somebody and put that enemy, that devil to shame and tell the person, this is what I'm struggling with. And that's where liberty comes. Let's begin to pray now. Let's begin to pray. I want you to pray for yourself and say, Lord, this is what I want to achieve in your house this year. This is what I am committing. This is what I am surrendering. In the name of Jesus, I want to see you move in my life. I want to be dedicated. I want to be committed to what you're doing. I want you to begin to present yourself. The Bible says, as a living sacrifice. Living yet sacrificed. Living yet surrendered. In the name of Jesus, year after year, you've been on the, on the fence. It's time to jump in. You stood at the sidelines, watching the water troubled. It's time to jump in. It's time to say, Lord, all or none. I want you to begin to pray now. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. Oh, As a church, we begin to surrender our lives. We begin to yield ourselves. And we say, Lord, that you will do what you will to do in us and through us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Open your mouth now begin to pray. And say, Lord, do it in me so that you can do it through me. Lord, do it in me so that when you do it for me, I will be blind. Do it in me so that you can do it through me. Oh, hallelujah. Touch my life so that I can be an extension of yours. In the name of Jesus, heal me so I can be an extension of your healing. In the name of Jesus, we stand as a church, Lord. We are saying this year has to be different, Lord. Oh, shate karaman dorobosha. Le karamaya de rebo santaranaba. We pray, we say, Lord, that you will touch through our hands. Look through our eyes. Walk in our steps. In the name of Jesus, till we become an expression of your kingdom. An expression of your love. An expression of your favor. An expression of divinity in this life. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you because there is a new beginning. We thank you for favor. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. In the name of Jesus, I want you to begin to pray. And say, Lord, I'm good. I'm not, I, things are, can't be the same. I refuse to be the same. I refuse to, to live after a, a form of godliness without life. I refuse to just come to church and have no fellowship with you. I refuse just to come to the house of God and not meet with the God of the house. In the name of Jesus, this year is a year of encounter. It's a year of life. It's a year of transformation for me. In the name of Jesus, that as I engage the presence of God, I will engage your presence. I will engage your spirit. I will engage your favor. In the name of Jesus, I refuse to be passive. Can you begin to pray now? Can you begin to pray? Begin to cry out from your heart. And say, Lord, this year is different for me. Hallelujah. It's different for me. It is different for me. In the name of Jesus. It's a new beginning for me. It's a new beginning for me. In the name of Jesus. It has to come out of your mouth. Open your mouth now and begin to tell the Lord. It says the new beginning for me in the name of Jesus. My life is being transformed. Father, I respond to the call to pray. The call to pray. I respond. The call to pray in the name of Jesus. In the church. At home. With my children. With my spouse. I respond to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Cala de Sotalaman de Christos. Oh, Rabbi Anzede de Andora de Sorani Mendes. Reketele Bedes. Open your mouth and begin to pray. And begin to yield yourself to the Lord this evening, this morning. Begin to yield yourself and say, Father, thank you because my life is changed. Thank you. I prophesy to the year your favor on my life. Can you open your mouth now and begin to prophesy? Begin to speak those words of life. Begin to say, This year is different in the name of Jesus. Begin to speak into your destiny. Begin to speak into the air and say, in the name of Jesus, in my path there is no sickness. In the name of Jesus, in my path there is no death. In the name of Jesus, in my path 
No accidents, no losses. Can it come out of your mouth? Begin to prophesy. Begin to prophesy the favor of God. Prophesy to the wind. Prophesy life to your destiny. Life to your purpose. In the name of Jesus, say this year is the year of my commitment. I am committed to the Lord like never before. In the name of Jesus, I will not be religious. In the name of Jesus, I am going to be free. I will live free and I will serve God free. In the name of Jesus, I refuse to live a life lower than what God has called me to live. Oh, Kasidoranish, Tananamandaranimons, as a people of prayer. Oh, Delegesorani, Irasoran and Ama, Yarenima, Yasterini Motors, Rekababasi Karenimen de Devotion. I want you to begin to pray and say, Lord, this year we're going to worship you like never before. We are going to worship you like never before. Worship team, we're going to worship him like never before. We are no, no more entertainment. Hallelujah. No more just singing on Sunday. That life is going to become a lifestyle. That worship is going to become a lifestyle. It's going to permeate in your house. It's going to permeate your car, your kitchen. Get it declared in the name of Jesus. We begin to practice the presence of God. So as we come together in this place, oh, it becomes a second nature. As we begin to worship, the glory of God will fill this place like never before. Lito Saya Nemaso Karanaman de Nemon Doronamon. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. This year we begin to practice the presence of God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Call the name and I say Karanamaya de Nemon Sharanama said in Emo Sharanaman. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. As we round up this morning. I want us to sing the second part of that chorus. There is no greater call. Can we lift up our hands to the Lord? Can you lift up your hands now and sing that song? There is no greater call, help me, than giving you my all. Come on now. There is no greater Everybody call now. than giving you my all. I lay it all down. I lay it all Everybody now, I want to hear you sing that. There is no greater love, no greater love, no higher name above. I lay it all down. I want to hear your voice. Lift up your hands to the Lord now. There is no greater call. Let me hear you. There is no greater call than giving you my all. I lay it all down. I lay it. There is no greater call than giving you my all. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. There is no greater love, no higher name above. I lay it You can have it all. We surrender our life, our program, everything we pursue in this life. We lay it at the altar now. We lay it at the altar now. We lay it at the altar now. You can have it all. That is now yours. Thank right, you, Jesus. We give you praise. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my yeah. world. Take this life and breathe on this heart that is. 
one tradition that I think needs to die in America, in the American church, and that is hurry. We're way too big of a hurry. We're way too big of a hurry. To get to what? Seriously, get to what? So, Father, right now, I, I thank you that you're teaching us to be a church that isn't in a hurry. Lord, as we just seek you and pursue you, and Lord, we want your presence. Because, Lord, we know in your presence there is fullness of joy. There is peace. There is healing. There is salvation. There is redemption. There is reconciliation in your presence. And, Lord, we need your presence. Lord, I pray that we will be couriers of your presence everywhere we go. And then when we gather together, it will be an explosion of your presence. Oh God, let this not just be a song. Let this be a truth, a declaration that you can have it all. You can have it all, Lord. You can have all of us. You can have our time. You can have anything that we value, everything that we care about, every dream, every possibility, you can have it all. Lord, we don't just give you our hurts and our sins and our frustrations. We give you all. Because, Lord, we want you to use us. See, God can only use that which he has all of. Because the Lord your God is a jealous God. Hallelujah. Let's sing this chorus together one more time. Just sing, you can have it all, God. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and This heart that is now yours. Now to sing. I surrender. I surrender all. Come on, church, just sing it. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I can just sense his presence sweeping in this place. Just sing, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee. All to thee, my blessed Savior. Have you been challenged this morning? Are you ready to seize this opportunity of a lifetime? Please extend your right hand forward. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, help us to be completely surrendered. All of our traditions, surrender them to you. Our lives, surrender them to you. Lord, we humble ourselves. We pray. We seek your face. We turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, we don't want to let this opportunity pass us by. We're going to take our corporate prayer to a new level. We're going to take our dedication to things of God to a new level. And we're going to let some things die. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Very often the Lord speaks to me uh, in dreams and visions. And... Uh, few moments ago I had a vision of a, a sheet of paper and a hand with a, a pen in its hand and I didn't know what God was was trying to show me because I didn't see anything on the paper and I, I didn't know whose hand it was and I just began to pray and then the vision became more clear and as pastor's been up here uh, speaking about revival it kind of all clicked for me then because I saw the sheet of paper and at the top of the sheet of paper 
was written DNR, do not resuscitate. And the hand represented the church and we had a pen in our hand and we were debating on, on whether are we going to sign this or not. I don't want to be a church that signs that sheet. Come on. Come I don't on. want to be a dead church. Come on. If we're not going to read the word and do all these things that we need to do, we are essentially signing that sheet. So I challenge you all, just like Pastor did, don't sign that sheet. Come on. And as it was so, it was so crazy because as we started singing, I surrender, we surrendered that pen. We dropped that pen. We are not going to sign that sheet at Lakeside Worship Center. I, I'd like to challenge us to fast. And that hasn't been mentioned. It might come as part of this upcoming conference, but uh, certainly that was, uh, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. But just an element of praying is, is fasting. And this last fall, when we fasted for a week, I have never had God reveal so much to me. I was feeling page after page after page in my journal on, on the drive to work. Revelation was coming to mind, and I was, I was desperately recording stuff on my cell phone because I couldn't stop and write it down. Uh, it was just pouring out. And actually, the funny thing was is that Sydney was getting the same message, and then, like, uh, so he totally took my message, like, the next week to, to, and shared with the men. But <laughs> it was confirmation that God was speaking, and it wasn't just me that was hearing the same message. Well, I know that uh, February 14th is Valentine's Day, but I just feel inspired to do this, and you can participate if you like, or you can do whatever you see fit. But since this conference is coming up on the 16th, 17th, and 18th, I'd like to call a fast the week prior to prepare. Now, if you feel the need to break it for a date, then, folks, this isn't a legalistic thing, Okay. No one has to do the entire time. Everyone just does something. Some of you are on medication, and there are things you can't do, but maybe you can uh, do something. Skip a meal or go without meat or, or do whatever your condition allows and see if maybe God won't hear your condition. Amen? But February 11th to the 18th, I like to call a corporate fast in preparation for this power conference because there's plenty of time to prepare ourselves mentally, physically, and emotionally. And again, no one has to do the whole time. If, if everyone could sign up for a day, what if everybody in this church signed up for one day? Every single person did a day. What would that accomplish? And maybe some more people did three. And then some did the whole seven. But whatever God calls you to do, this is between you and God. We'll have a sign up ready at the first of the month for you to be able to put your name down as to which times you will serve. And this is a corporate public fast. This isn't a private one like Jesus was talking about. And uh, we're we'll also, we'll have the church available every morning from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day that week for us to have corporate prayer because I believe that God wants to move. And every time we have one of these conferences, this is going to be the format. We're going to prepare our hearts. We're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to believe God, and he's going to do incredible things. God bless you. Beth and I have home group at our house tonight. We'd love to have you. Um, it's always a great time. If you've never been before, this would be a great time to start. God bless you and keep you. Have a great day.